Yeah, Helleba is, is one of the largest uh, lender to commercial real estate in Europe and actually beyond. Um, we, have a, we manage a loan book of a roughly 36 billion euros. Uh, half of that in Germany, half of that outside, with the U.S. being the predominant market in that sector. But and, uh, elsewhere, it is in Europe, more in northern and western Europe, and also Poland and Czech Republic. And we lend about uh, 8 to 10 billion new business every year. Um, part of that is uh, syndication or syndicated further on, and increasingly also to non-banks, of course, to funds to insurance companies and other investors. Anthony. Thank you, Jane. So my name is Anthony Shale. I'm from UBS. Uh, I'm responsible for the uh, real estate debt business in UK and Europe within the real estate and private markets team, uh, which is part of the asset management division of UBS. Um, the area we concentrate on at the moment is UK. We have an ambition to uh, expand that further in the fullness of time uh, and in practical terms we are a debt fund what we lend against is the more niche type activities and properties around the market and that would be what we aim to continue doing in the short to medium term thank you Christoph. thank you jane my name is Christoph wagner i work in th real estate on the debt side uh, th real estate is a wholly owned subsidiary of tia which is a large u.s and global insurance uh, and pension provider. We manage about $100 billion um, in commercial property assets globally. About a quarter of that is invested in commercial real estate debt. So we have a large book in the US and an increasing presence in the UK and Europe with over a billion pounds um, in debt on our books. Um, we lend out of two mandates predominantly. One is our balance sheet and the other mandate is a debt fund. So we work in parts of the market that are less well covered by banks, whether that's duration-wise or property type-wise. Okay. Good afternoon. Thank you, Jane. My name is Christoph Murciani. I've become a banker by accident 25 years ago, and I hope that over 25 years some of the visible signs have dwindled. Uh, I've become a property lender 15 years ago by choice, uh, and I now run the uh, debt funds, the commercial real estate debt funds business of a company called Akofi, which is being dwarfed by my three friends. <laughs> we have a book of two and a half billion euros across all asset class, of which real estate is one third. Uh, we raise equity from insurance companies, and we deploy that in the eurozone in uh, senior secured financing. We're trying as well as uh, Anthony to find out the odd lots and not compete head to head with uh, traditional lenders. Great. I'm going to start by asking all of the panelists if they could give us their views on um, the kind of current state of debt liquidity across European markets at the moment. Um, and it seems to me we have a completely normalized uh, debt market now. Um, and that there's a, a lender pretty much for every opportunity and every asset out there. Um, cheap debt as well is helping to underpin a direct market, which, as we all know, is storming away at the moment. And people that I've been talking to around the show here in the last day or two are all talking about 3% being the new 4% for, um, for assets. So... Uh, debt, I think, is probably playing into what, what's going on on the direct market side, as it always does. Um, so I was going to ask Michael, if you don't mind, just kicking off and, and giving, giving me your view about that. Yeah, th coming from the numbers I mentioned, uh, we have a, I think we have a pretty good overview of what's happening and what the market speaks. And uh, as you say, three is the new four, at least when the cap rates are concerned. Mm -hmm. And that is for Germany and France, which means Paris region, basically. Uh, definitely, we are there or sometimes even beyond. Um, and, and also for lending, it's that the case. I mean, very liquid markets. Um, everybody would like to have exposure either on the principal side, investment side, or on the debt side. And um, the, the, well, I mean, that is public knowledge. The, the margins for senior core loans in Germany are well below 1%, like over, over Euribor. And um, in, in France, maybe a little bit higher, but, but that is sort of the top end of the market. And then you have uh, several 
steps down, but overall the liquidity is, is very good and uh, in, in all markets, with, with some exceptions when you go to, say, Southeast Europe, like Romania, Bulgaria, only the Austrians would lend there, but they lend there at higher prices, of course. Um, Spain is, is very liquid, actually, if, if for new business. You see the margins coming down very quickly. Um, Southern Europe in general, Italy, Portugal is maybe a little bit difficult, but that's a small market. But anyway, for the rest of Europe, very, very liquid. And, uh, yeah. and, and is that for smaller secondary cities as well as for the, you know, the, the big yeah. capitals? Yeah, actually, while, while, while you say this, um, I think there's a correlation between uh, how the market develops and this kind of, yeah, where is the prime, where is secondary. Mm. Um, we saw in the last crisis, in the downturn, that the secondary locations were almost illiquid as sort of like the assets. And, and so went the ratings and everything that went, what has to do with the financing. But today, I mean, the, the, the capitals and the main uh, uh, hotspots are over bought, let's say, people cannot get exposure there or only at ridiculous prices. And so there's a natural outflow to secondary locations. And uh, I mean, what was a secondary location maybe yesterday is a mm. quite sought after location today. And yeah. also the secondary sort of has moved out. Um, we, don't, we do not see constraints in that. I mean, people go also to small, small uh, locations. It struck me when, when we, we lent quite actively in Poland and it was like two years ago we saw a Korean institutional investor buying a, or like providing the capital for a shopping center in a 50,000 people city in northern Poland. And I remember it, had, it was like three, four years ago we really had an issue in explaining to our credit committee where that is and why we would like to do that. <laughs> mm. and, and, and so quick it, it went finally. Yeah. Would any of the rest of the panel like to pick up on that question? I mean, particularly in terms of whether you, you know you agree that the liquidity is sloshed right across into most markets and um, you know most jurisdictions now. It looks like you're both Christoph. Do you want to go first? Uh, sure. Um, I agree with your comment that there is liquidity in uh, the debt market, and and that's probably fueling mm. um, some of the pricing we see in direct markets. Um, I would also say that from a longer term perspective, we're still in a very low interest rate environment yep. and investors are continuing to look at that when they seek yield and property yep. in most large institutional investors' portfolios is one of the asset classes where they can get yield and current income out of their investments. Um, compared to bonds and equities, certainly. Mm. Um, so that underpins some of the dynamic. When you zoom in a little bit, though, um, I think Germany, certainly, and France do stand out as those markets in Europe where there really is a lot of debt and very efficiently priced debt yeah. and at fairly high LTVs available out of the banking sector. Yeah. Um, what we've seen in the UK over the last few years is non-bank lenders, insurance companies and debt funds such as ours um, taking a much higher share of the uh, new origination market, about 25% according to the uh, latest DMU numbers now, um, then that was historically the case. So there is a lot more variety available in that market which caters to different niches and banks are constrained certainly in the UK at around 55-60% uh, loan to value for most um, general um, commercial real estate assets. Of course, trophy buildings attract higher LTVs and very low margins, but by and large, uh, slotting, um, which is a UK regulatory regime, does hold banks back at fairly moderate uh, loan to values, which for the right projects means that players like us um, yep. can look at yep. providing slightly higher leverage and maybe against refurbishment projects or other opportunities that are more difficult for a bank that doesn't have direct property exposure to get their heads around. Yeah. So the, the, the most efficient, most efficiently priced markets then are the markets where the banks are still kind of ruling the roost, if you like, Ger Germany and France. So you're making that distinction, saying in the UK, the banks perhaps are more hamstrung maybe or more restricted in what they can do than perhaps they are in France and Germany. Is that what you mean? 
Well, I would be interested in, in hearing yeah. uh, the um, banker's perspective on that. Mm. Um, but I think that regulation is holding banks back in yeah. um, the yeah. UK to an extent that it doesn't in, say, Germany. Yeah. Also, the German market has a um, peculiarity in the sense that um, German mortgage banks have access to very efficiently priced fund brief capital. Um, and that's a well-trodden path, yeah. certainly for prime deals and moderate leverage that goes yeah. into that way to refinance the debt. Yeah, yeah. So are there, are there other markets um, where you see inefficiencies in pricing, if you like? I mean, you talked about France and Germany being so efficiently price that it's perhaps hard to find opportunities? I think the, what's been very interesting in the past few years is that there's been a convergence in the regulatory changes. The banks have found it more costly to hold capital against real estate, while insurance companies were incentivized by uh, having lesser requirements for uh, equity or, uh, capital against debt versus direct uh, property holdings. So there has been a a tiering of lenders that's occurred uh, ever s over the past five or six years, with some lenders being um, more on the hunt of longer dated exposure, which can fit some investment strategy, and other uh, lenders wanting to gain uh, either multi-jurisdictional exposure or specific asset class exposures, uh, specializing either in hotel properties or in logistics assets. And that has made some markets uh, extremely efficient. However, I'd say that even on the French market, there are spots uh, where liquidity doesn't meet uh, the borrower's needs, whether it's um, too small for a large syndicate of bank, where, whether it's too large for a regional player. And that's where some of the debt funds can find niche to cater for the needs of the borrowers and generating the extra mile in terms of return for their institutional investors. Um, and I, I'm not as familiar, obviously, as my neighbor, uh, of, uh, with my neighboring countries as I am with the French markets, but I can see bits and pieces in Germany or in Italy where it is still the case that there's, there are gaps in the uh, lenders' coverage where debt funds can play a role in addition to being partners in larger syndications. Mm. Uh, so I think what we really need to, the, the lesson we have learned over the past few years is that tiering of uh, the offer from either insurance companies, debt funds, senior or mezzanine, uh, domestic or cross borders. And each of them has a different mix of direct origination and participation in syndicates. And that makes it very interesting for uh, our industry at the moment. Mm. And, and it seems there's still new debt funds coming into the market. I mean, I, I had thought it might slow down by now, to be honest, and that by this year perhaps there would be, be fewer. But, um, uh, you know, there have been a number just in the last few months, and some of them are, as you say, very focused on very specific markets, perhaps, you know, DPOs in Netherlands or something. Or, um, but they're still coming in. I mean, is, is that a trend that, that you see? And perhaps Anthony maybe you could take this question first. Do you, do you, this part two of the question is, are you in competition yourself with other debt funds? Um, taking part one, there probably should be more debt funds coming into the market. Uh, not because it's my business and I need to make a living, um, but I think that a more diverse universe of uh, real estate lenders is a much healthier market than one that is dominated purely by lending banks. I'm not saying that lending banks are wrong. I'm not saying that the debt fund providers are only ever right. But what is important is to have a diversity because each different provider of lending capital has a different risk return profile. And that means they can behave differently according to the market cycle. If you have just one profile of risk capital, they all behave the same way that creates not a tipping point in the cycle, but actually can create avalanches in the cycle, which we have seen, my memory goes back three, four cycles. So we saw it in the GFC, we saw it in the 90s, we saw it in the 80s, and even back before then in the 70s. As soon as the market moves, all of the providers who have the same risk backgrounds act in the same way. If you can diversify that risk background, people can behave in different ways and therefore not accelerate uh, property market shifts. So I think we can always benefit as a market 
from a wider universe of providers. I think the second issue is more about is it a, a thing that can be managed effectively? So if I can draw an analogy, so we're all very familiar with penguins. And if you look at a penguin, one looks the same as the other. <coughs> Do we have too many penguins in the Antarctic? Of course we don't. They're all different. And the importance of that is that everybody assumes lenders are the same. We all play different roles within the market. And I think the importance of that cannot be underestimated. So what one lender is comfortable looking at, another group of lenders will simply say, not our risk, not our job. And I think that helps also to balance the market as a whole. So if we are to see the European debt market stabilize and expand in a controlled and sensible fashion, there have to be more players. They have to come from many more diversified sources than simply just being banks. It if, if I may add, it's not just a matter of having the same view of risks, but also being under regulation that has sometimes been criticized as being pro-cyclical. You, you need more equity as a bank lender if you fund a property that's vacant and needs refurbishment than if you fund a very prime building with a long-term lease. In five years' time, one property is likely to have gained in value because you've refurbished it and released it at current market rates, whereas the other property may have lost in value because your lease is already five years old as you strike the loan, and the property is going to be 20 years old when the, loan, the, when the, the lease expires. So there's, it's not just that we have different risk appetites, it is that also sometimes we're under one regulation that is pro-cyclical and that adds to the risk of ballooning exposures at the detriment, to the detriment of other exposures that would be safer. Mm. Michael, do you, yeah, what the, do you think the, about the pro-cyclicality regu regulation? The, yeah. yeah, there's one, one sort of, what is it, not a precondition, but a, a, con a fact here in the context that is the low interest rate level, which is unprecedented and also I slightly object to your uh, conclusion that, that we might face another whatever, because the, the, in all the previous crises, the interest rate, the cost of money played a significant role. Banks had to accelerate because they were against the wall. In the last downturn, the banks were not against the wall because the cost of money was just going through the roof or the clients were in that situation. It was more a, 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 a regulatory issue, a value issue, an illiquidity issue. And illiquidity has nothing to do with... Uh, yeah, well, everybody has his own opinion about value and uh, price, but but the the previous, like the last crisis, was unprecedented in their in the the, the mechanics that were put to work, and um, the, the 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 worth and the the meaning of liquidity that is a lesson we all learned, I think, and um, so. And that was also the basis for the rise of the debt funds, I would say, why they were incepted anyway, because people were not happy with like what they could earn with their other fixed income uh, products, and they needed diversification, adding a little bit of a risk flavor to it, and then, of course, leaving sometimes the senior lending what the banks would, would provide. The fund brief uh, margins are, of course, lower what, what, what you yeah. could, could propose to your, for your investors, but... Yeah, please go ahead. I was going to say, I have two observations. Whilst I don't disagree with Michael, um, I think the comment I'd make is, first of all, every single cycle that I ever remember, and I, my memory sadly goes back four cycles, um, no one cycle has ever been the same. That is, that is as true as you can ever make a statement. That's axiomatic. However, what you can say is that when a cycle shifts, when you have a preponderance or high concentration of funding sources with similar profiles, that can accelerate the shift of the cycle, which was my point. Mm. Um, I don't uh, have an issue with what Michael says about interest rates per se, and indeed, the comment I would make to rebut Michael's statement now is that in the context of today's interest rates, we have, for almost 10 years, become very much dependent on low interest rates. Mm. Yields have come down in the real estate market, so when interest rates creep up, we're pushing against already compressed yields. So there is an inherent risk of overtaking the property yield with your interest rate because those yields have come right down. If property yields then creep back up, 
perhaps that could be itself the trigger to a new excursion, negative excursion, of the real estate market. So I don't think it's quite as clear cut mm. as to say simply interest rates are the cause of recession. And I don't think valuation is simply the cause of recession. There are many different factors. Mm. Where I do strongly believe the market has a lot still to learn is the appropriate measurement of risk in relation to how much lending is allocated to that risk component. And the nearest we're getting to that today is the different sources of lending capital all have different risk functions determined by their sources of funding. So in a debt fund, we are 100% equity funded, but our investors have a particular risk preference. In a bank, you are a sliver of equity and a large proportion of either treasury market operations or bond operations. So in the mortgage banks, obviously it's bond. And that has its own risk profile attached to it. And it's that combination of risk profiles that actually adds the uh, breadth of the spectrum that the market desperately needs to create. Otherwise, we do run a very strong risk of heading back to where we were in previous cycles for whatever cause it is that changes the market. We talk about barbell approaches in so many different funds. And the barbell comes out of the fixed income market because it's a duration matching technique. Just remember, the barbell only works in a good market. As soon as the market shifts its dynamic, the barbell becomes very lopsided and it ceases to be a matched model. In terms of the roles and the specialities that different market participants bring to debt capital markets, I just wanted to draw out the notion of different skill sets because banks are clearly very good at some things that um, they do and provide many things even, <laughs> I grant you that. Um, and so one of those th aspects is certainly flexibility around the term of funding. You can do very short-term loans, you can provide five-year term debt, you can provide 10-year term debt. Um, so for, for construction lending, I think that is a skill set that's very difficult to replicate in a fund because all of our funds like some element of duration. Our investors come in for a given term and we want to match that with our lending. So there are certain aspects that banks do extremely well um, mm. and that are very difficult to replicate. Um, where I think funds like ours um, should excel in the marketplace is with financing projects that have very specific property angles, whether these are refurbishments or loans on buildings that have two or three years left on a lease mm. and significant reletting risk. Mm. Um, and I understand that that's much harder to assess out of a banking context, um, where your committee would be composed of leveraged finance experts and bond market experts and people who've got property lending experience. Um, so speaking of our com company, all we do is 100% commercial property. So um, yeah. our analysis really is focused on the actual asset um, mm. that we're secured on. And we can underwrite market rents and we have a view on where the market is going. We have a view on locations. We carry out extensive research. And this is a skill set that I don't think is that readily available in some institutions. Just on that, that point about the, you know, your, the view that you take on the markets and, 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 and sort of financing these more uh, difficult assets, perhaps, if that's the right word for them. I mean, what, what's your view, and Anthony as well, about um, you know, taking letting risk in the UK at the moment, bearing in mind that you know, Brexit, no one knows what the hell is going on and what's going to happen to, um, you know, to rents next year. Um, how do you, as, as debt funds who are very focused on those kind of assets, perhaps which often you know, do have letting risks, how, how do you have to adjust your, if, if at all? We actually don't think that necessarily um, short remaining lease terms are such a terrible aspect of a property that we lend on. Um, oftentimes we found that properties can be reversionary and we can underwrite through the refurbishment costs, we can 
structure a transaction to suit the profile of the underlying asset and mitigate the risks that, uh, for example, a lease break or a lease expiry uh, brings. Where I would echo uh, Christoph's comments on my, uh, on my right here is that the key risks and Brexit-imposed risks are probably more pronounced on long-led prime City of London office buildings where you know, current yields that are being paid are certainly in the threes or even close to 3%. So um, those assets from our perspective um, yep. can sometimes be riskier um, than properties that do need some work where you plan through what's required and you reserve for that in the structure of your, your loan. Yeah. Yeah. Is there... Sorry, sorry, Ma just, maybe yeah. I can just take one step back as to com competition between debt funds. The first thing we compete against each other for is our investors' uh, subscriptions. And most of them come from a property equity investment background and have made the decision to shift some of that allocation to debt. And they need to realize one thing that's extremely important. When you do equity investments, you can afford to lose a bit on an asset and sell your next property way above your business plan. In the debt space, you have lent 100 and your borrower will repay 100. So you cannot really afford to lose half a cent or a pound in the first loan. You will not make it up in the second. So even though you know property well and you've been trading properties for a number of years, shifting from an equity position to a debt position requires another discipline and a uh, more of a negative bias than an optimistic bias on the properties. Uh, and that is what we're trying to uh, educate our investors on when we market the funds, is that we aim for zero default or at least enough recovery that there is zero default after an event happens on the loan. That, that I think is the first point where we compete against one another is actually to raise equity and then deploying it obviously, but then, then it's the normal you know, market forces between uh, supply and demand. Yeah, Michael. Although different uh, funds also Chris, have very Michael different remits. Okay. I just wanted sure. to add that um, complexity, so um, not all funds are written with the same parameters in mind. Mm. So this goes back to Anthony's point, there is variety within the debt fund spectrum as mm. well. Yeah, Michael. Yeah, but, but you have a very interesting point there because that is what we really observe uh, quite um, vividly at the moment and that is the market as such. Fixed income versus property or versus real estate. Like, like a spectrum going from, from yeah. red to deep blue. Yeah. These are the colors that merge into each other. And there are investors, also lenders, who tend to or see real estate more as a fixed income product. So they go for long leases, uh, solid locations. They have a clear mindset about first and secondary locations. Yeah. Um, and then there are investors and lenders and funds who have an understanding of more the red zone, let's say, go to the orange and say, well, we can do this and there's a reposition. And, and, uh, and, and that is also, I mean, that the whole debt universe is, is like at the moment. Um, that, uh, I mean, there are very few, few platforms that really go for just one, one segment. Um, and, and for us speaking, I mean, we like when there's the property flavor into it because that means also a little bit higher price. We could our make put our experience to work. It's not just um, a capital play and where we have to match cash flows and, and uh, interest rates and everything, mm -hmm. but where we really can have a guess, of, not only a guess, but a clear statement and opinion about what this lease will produce in two, three years. And the releasing situation in London is of course something that we have on the radar. Yeah. And, um, and and that is, I think, where the success factors lies. If you if you see uh, the the debt fund business and and real estate as such as just a fixed income play, um, yeah, you ride the, the 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 interest rate curves. But but um, you you really should, being a, an investor, a lender, a fund manager, have a good understanding of what your product actually is, and 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 propose something valuable to the stakeholder that you work for. Mm. I, I think. Michael's 100% right on this. Um, at the end of the day, uh, if a lender doesn't understand the asset they've lent on, what on earth are they doing lending on it? Um, 
we take the view at UBS that if you wouldn't be happy owning the asset, why did we lend on it in the first place? So our underwriting process focuses 110% on that asset. If I cannot convince the real estate team in the market I'm active in that this is a sensible piece of property or real estate, then I can't lend. It's as simple as that. I cannot lend because they won't sanction it at the lending committee. My lending committee, the way I set it up, is 80% property people and only 20% lenders. The lenders give me a hard time because I've ignored credit sometimes and I don't do that anymore. Um, but the really important feature is I get up in the morning, I look in the mirror and I say, did I make a silly loan because I'm embarrassed to have that on my balance sheet now? If I can't say, no, I'm not embarrassed, I shouldn't be doing the loan. And we've had these cases regularly where the lending team has said, why are you lending on that? Because this asset simply doesn't work. Whether it's the rent, whether it's relettability, whether it's a cost of capex and refurb, whatever aspect it is, if you can't make that justification about the real estate, frankly, you shouldn't be lending. Can I come back to the investors that Christoph mentioned just now? Um, I was uh, in a session this morning um, and uh, one of the speakers there said that there was uh, about seven billion of capital uh, being raised at the moment um, for debt in Europe, which is, you know, not inconsiderable amount. I mean, is, is it your experience that there are still more investors coming over to the idea that they would like to invest in, you know, part of their, their real estate allocation may, would be in debt and they'd like to do that. And is it, is it just European investors or are, are we seeing, you know, parallels with what's happening in the equity market with Asian investors? Are there Asian investors who also want to invest in debt in Europe? Not only do they want, they have already. I mean, some of them have uh, entered the market with what we would have considered mezzanine or whole loan up to 75% LTV because they were in search for uh, higher yields than your traditional uh, senior mortgage facilities. And we are currently marketing to investors that are Asian-based uh, and we feel that um, this is already reality for some of them. Uh, whether through potentially our platform of Blessy, we cross our fingers, uh, or that have already lent essentially in the UK where they have found um, larger tickets because these investors generally come for significant uh, allocations rather than, you know, the small end of the, of the ticket size. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Christoph, I think you have Asian investors. Uh, yeah, that's clients, right. Clients, don't you? Yeah, we have yeah. Um, yeah. Asian investors in our fund and similar to other institutional investors they are looking at relative value mm. and commercial real estate debt offers currently excellent um, relative value both compared to direct real estate investment mm. where some people do see volatility ahead mm. and we can offer a product that has um, significant equity subordination so a buffer yeah. against any market fluctuations and we can offer a high current coupon mm. um, that is um, often in excess of what you could achieve with investing in prime property directly from rental income. Mm. And um, in a context where we still have historically low interest rates, mm. clearly commercial real estate debt offers a useful pickup even if it's pure senior uh, loans mm. compared to bond investments um, which um, yeah. you know, might be triple B corporates and you get a margin of 100 or 150 basis points mm. um, and you don't have asset security, you're um, secured mm. on an operating business. Yeah. So from those perspectives, there is um, significant interest from investors globally, including Asia. And uh, Michael, I mean, there are, there are Asian banks also um, lending in Europe. I mean, particularly, uh, there's a the handful of Chinese banks, but they're big banks, and they've done some very big deals. Um, there's been a lot of focus, again, in the equity market on Chinese capital, whether it's going to be called back um, to China or whether it's this is a blip and it's going to stay. I mean, what's your view about the Chinese banks 
position in lending across Europe, Mark? In, in, in Europe, not yet really. I mean, but as I mentioned, we have a, we have a $10 billion loan book in the US we, we manage and uh, some two to three billion we write every year. Mm-hmm. And we lose, uh, well, we lose sometimes against Chinese banks in the, in the bidding. And, and they are able, I mean, the, just the sheer size they operate under, they write 500, 600 million loans just like that. No covenants, no nothing. <laughs> and you just... And perhaps less regulation. I, I mean... Uh, well, I don't know. I mean, they should better if, if I'm following the papers, what's going on in, in China. Mm. But, mm. but um, well, this also will certainly come to some sort of natural um, habit and, and, and manner. But... but um, the Chinese banks are um, also um, getting operative. I mean, we see what we see in the U.S. I, I expect to come over to Europe. It's just a matter that they cannot really give, get the sizes. I mean, what is like 50 to 100 million euros for us? I mean, they would need in their. Uh, model maybe like I don't know 300 400 500 there's, there's a lot of very big and, investments and you, you, you don't have that now, many large there? buildings <laughs> yeah, or portfolios yeah. here in Europe yeah. just simply speaking yeah, yeah. whilst uh, in in the US uh, a market like Manhattan I mean in every street you find like a building that is worth one billion dollars like easily um, so so that is a natural turf and uh, um, also on the west coast in San Francisco and Los Angeles you can see that um, not only from the investment side but also from the lending side commercial yeah. real estate is gradually infiltrated or infiltrated, I don't know how to say, by, by Chinese money, definitely. Mm. Mm. Um, yeah, but they, they play a certain role if, if you have a very sound product, but also they take risk, I have to say. Um, but also in London, one big yeah. building in yeah. Bishopsgate where we also yeah. then done. So it's, it's actually something that we see, but I would not say, I mean, that this, this is a different league. I mean, they're playing in and, and a huge amount of capitals. This is what, let's say, before the financial crisis, banks like Morgan Stanley provided or something, um, maybe not as a debt product, but when it came to putting up 500, 600 million, just like that. So there is still a need for that, but on a limited basis. I don't see that really as a competition as such no. very soon. Uh, yes, I wondered if any one of you is active in the Dutch market and what your, what your thoughts are about the market. At TH Real Estate, we run two mandates. One is a core senior lending program, and that is open for business in the Dutch market, um, as well as the UK, the Netherlands, and Spain. So um, we focused on um, markets that we know well and where we believe there is a, um, a gap in debt supply um, rather than going into um, France and Germany um, in addition to the UK. So um, the Netherlands is on our our radar screen and we think it is a market where we should be active um, in particular because um, buildings other than prime uh, office and retail assets do not readily get capital structures um, that are necessarily attractive for all the equity investors needs. Uh, of, of the approximately 1 billion we have deployed over the past five years, two deals, so that's roughly 10% of our transactions, had uh, either a sole uh, Dutch component, one residential deal, or a fraction of a hotel portfolio that had Dutch assets in them. And for our fifth fund that we're currently deploying, we are going to credit on October 24th, as it's extremely specific, on, on, a, on an office transaction that uh, we'd like to uh, lend against. So, yes, we are uh, definitely uh, happy with the Dutch market and the prospects therein. Uh, from, from our perspective, whilst the first fund is UK only, our next fund is most certainly going to have a European flavor. Given my comments about understanding real estate assets, where we lend is where we have European real estate businesses. That is quite definitely the Netherlands, Germany, Spain, Italy, France. Very happy with those countries. I don't see any reason why we wouldn't want to lend. People worry about Italy. I don't. People worry about other countries. I say, providing we understand the real estate, where we have those people on the ground, we're going to lend. Yeah, just to compliment that, um, we also lend to the Netherlands. We have exposure in Amsterdam, in Rotterdam, in office and also retail and speaking for the German banks in general I would say um, there I, to my recollection there are like three or four with local offices on the ground uh, focused on or very much emphasizing real estate lending um, so um, 
I would say there are about like five, maybe six lenders from Germany active in the Netherlands and increasingly uh, some uh, have uh, also deployed money into the housing sector, into residential, which is something we have not a local presence yet. So that is something where you really have to understand the local specialities. But the liquidity is definitely increasing. I mean, massively at the moment, I would say. Yeah. Mm. The, the, the question that I wanted to ask was about the, the sort of more operating asset classes in real estate. Um, so uh, alternative real estate, but not sort of the kind of residential uh, lending that, you know, that you're interested in doing. Um, I guess hotels probably falls into this category. But, you know, it's an, an, another obvious trend in terms of where the equity is going at the moment is more into alternative asset classes. And we all know why for many people that's to get some extra yield over the traditional asset classes. But it still seems there are far fewer lenders who are in the market to lend on, you know, senior housing or care homes or some of these, um, you know, uh, perhaps more, slightly more difficult asset classes. And yet it's, it, it's where a lot of the, the equity wants to lend. Do you, do you think there's any kind of, um, you know, a lender's not keeping up or have I got the wrong kind of idea there, would you say? Are you, are you keeping up? <laughs> well, uh, Hellebus is a good example, isn't it? I mean, Michael, I think you, you do logistics, retail, Yeah, logistics, logistics uh, well, you don't do ho- it's sort of on the break. No, we, do, yeah. we are not into hotel, actually. Yeah, no. But that is not because we consider hotels or operated properties to be too risky, but it's a different asset class. I mean, the operative as- aspect is mm. prevailing there. Um, the hotel, I mean, you, you cannot just uh, host the people under open air, so you, it's more a device for your operation mm. um, than, than real estate in our perception. And when you look around, I mean, all the major lenders who are active in that field have dedicated teams for that. Uh, we have this not yet, let's say, but uh, let's see. But for the moment, it's not really something on our radar. There are others who do that. I, I think the issue for us is that oftentimes, as you rightly pointed out, you need to have a very strong operator. And they generally look for portfolio refinancing of a significant size that we cannot underwrite or hold ourselves. And therefore, we need to participate in a lending syndicate where oftentimes our, our maximum uh, single exposure causes us to be under 20% or even 15% of the overall exposure. And we don't control our fate. We don't have a a blocking minority for key decisions that have to do with monitoring and managing loans, waivers, covenant breaches, etc. So we feel that these transactions don't give us the level of control at this juncture because of their size uh, that that we would like to have in in managing our portfolio. Therefore, for the time being, we've shied away from them. Yeah, when we look at the real estate security, we like liquidity, both in the reletting market and also in the transactional market for the assets that underpin our loans and that's just much more difficult to see in truly alternative asset classes such as care homes or other highly regulated sectors Um, and where we've gone in terms of alternatives is we've lent on student accommodation we've lent on co-working space and so these are examples where it's not completely established use classes for some lenders, but we feel that we're well positioned to understand those asset types Mm. and structure attractive loans for for borrowers that create attractive returns for our investors. I think the um, approach we take is we're very much in favor of alternatives. We've done student accommodation, hotels, build and investment, um, care homes, data centers, build to sell residential. We've got residential letting portfolios. Um, We're very comfortable with alternatives in the broadest possible sense. Where we get a little bit uncomfortable is in very dedicated healthcare, so that's hospitals, because that's a very complex area. Um, And the area of schools, although universities, not quite so bad. So those two are sort of off limits for us. We don't do golf courses because my swing is atrocious, Um, but otherwise we're really comfortable with leisure assets. Um, We've looked at pubs, we've looked at cinemas. Um, We we didn't do them in the end because we couldn't get enough um, control 
on the operational aspect. But for us, we're very comfortable with operating assets. What we look for, and I think it's already been hinted at, is that if you're in an operational asset, is your income flow lease driven or operational driven? If it's lease driven, can you find a new tenant? If it's operational driven, you've got to get under the skin of the operator and you've got to be quite certain that you can find another operator. If the asset intrinsically works, but it's a bad operator, you'll replace them. If the operator is bad and the asset is bad, what on earth will we be lending on it in the first place for? So you've got to be able to tick the right boxes. That's, that's how we see it. Okay. Um, very, very quickly, because we're out of time, but um, I just wanted to ask you as well whether any of you see anything on the horizon which might cause liquidity to change in the next sort of 12 to 24 months? I mean, we've talked about interest rates, which is an obvious one. Is there anything else out there that you think might affect the kind of efficient, more efficient liquid markets we're all contributing to at the moment? Anyone would like to take that? Yeah, I have a quick one. I mean, I don't see any. Only, say, the black swan uh, is something I would expect, or not expect, but could, I could imagine, like uh, Kim Jong un going berserk or uh, one or two Chinese bubbles busting, but, but um, from, from the financial markets. I mean, this, remember, we, we all tend to go to these conferences, to these fairs. Um, three, four years ago, everybody was saying, oh, how long will the interest le level be that low? One more year, maybe two? I mean, we are way beyond any two, three, four, four five-year periods, and, and nobody makes a guess now, does it take one or two leads? You hear at least for the next two years, and that means basically more. So there's no end in sight of the low interest rate levels, which will mean lots of business for you guys, <laughs> and, and, and uh, low cost of money, but even more carefully taking the, 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 the risks and detecting the bumps uh, into it. And, and so I would, my, my guess would be, or my expectation would be, an outside event that has nothing to do with the financial world, with real estate, with finance, but something political, something I rather would not like to imagine. Yeah, okay. I'm, um, I'm concerned maybe not a year from now, but maybe two. We see uh, increasingly borrowers wanting to hold properties for a long time, but then hedge for a short period of time because volatility is expensive, because the yield curve is steepening after two years. And they expect increasingly to create value, at least in part through financial engineering rather than property appreciation and hands-on work. Um, it's, you know, people say 2017 is not 2007. It may be 2005 in that respect. So that would be my point of caution going forward.